was not only really particularly about Connolly and Irish politics, it was mainly about Connolly's contribution to the socialist movements. And I think the importance of both James Connolly and John McLean is obvious, as you alluded to. Above all, the position they both took in August 1914 in opposing the First World War and Britain's participation in that war as part of the revolutionary anti-imperialist wing of the international socialist movement. I think, and I'll come try to explain this, I think Connolly more so than John McLean, but I'll try and explain how I think that is. In starting, I think one of the most incredible things is that in my current investigation, I can find no evidence, and if someone else could help me in this, of, of Conway and McLean actually meeting. This is despite the fact that when Conway returned to Ireland from uh, the United States of America, we've been an organiser for the industrial workers of the world, he spent quite a lot of time here touring, uh, helping, mainly the Socialist Labour Party, different organisation from McLean, so maybe that explains it, but I find no reference anywhere to McLean and Conway encountering, uh, encountering uh, e each other. Conway was, of course, executed on the 12th of May 1916, following the Easter Rising. We can't say what attitude he would have taken to the Russian Revolution in 1917. But we do know his son, Roddy, was a member, a founding member of the Irish Communist Party and was a participant in the Communist International Congress in uh, Moscow, where he met Lenin, and he was pictured with, uh, a, a picture with, uh, uh, with Lenin. Uh, McLean, of course, lived to see the 1917 October Revolution in Russia, and again, I think it's to his immense credit that he immediately supported and defended it. And his being appointed the Soviet consul in Glasgow was recognition of that. And Lenin singled him out as the outstanding figure in the British socialist movement and was extremely keen to have him participating in a new form British Communist Party and indeed the Communist uh, 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 International. Now, the two men came... Uh, from slightly different generations, and of course came to socialism in two very different cities. John McLean literally came from down below in the Cowgate, the little Ireland of the, uh, of, uh, of the day, where the plaque and the memorial is, uh, is to him. And McLean, of course, came and, uh, from, uh, from, Gla uh, from Glasgow. And I think there's quite important differences here. The Scottish Socialist Federation, which Connolly joined in 1889, was the Scottish affiliate of the Social Democratic Federation. I'm sorry about these names. The Social Democratic Federation, the SDF, was Britain's first avowedly Marxist organisation. But one whose leader, Henry Heinemann, an ex-Tory, clashed with Marx, and in particular with Engels, who could not abide him. Uh, the SDF leadership was very sectarian and was opposed to strikes and trade unions, uh, on a, again, a sectarian basis, and did it had a leaflet which it handed out to strikers explaining what they were doing was folly, uh, which must have gone, I, I, I got, I gone down well. And Henry Heinemann, this leading figure in this organisation, was himself intensely nationalistic. One of the reasons I think he didn't like Engels in, uh, in, uh, in, uh, in particular. The Edinburgh SSF, which uh, Connolly joined, was very different. First of all, it was far from nationalistic, and it contained members from abroad who could offer a much wider perspective. Leo uh, Mellon had fled France after the defeat of the 1871 com Commune, the first working class attempt at power, had been a, a mayor in one of the, the uh, arrondissements of Paris during the, the, uh, the co uh, Commune, and uh, con uh, con uh, came for uh, bringing a, pers a much wider perspective. For instance, he was uncompromising in advocating revolution. Without the shedding of blood, there is no social salvation, he argued. Andrew Schu sailed, uh, hailed from Austria, was a staunch atheist and was a long-standing opponent of Heinemann, who'd been a supporter of both William Morris and Eleanor Marx, who in my book are much more attractive figures in terms of the developing, the beginning of the British, uh, British socialist uh, movement. People might know that Eleanor Marx played a very prominent role in the new unionism of the early uh, 18, uh, 18, uh, 1890s. John Wesley, who came from Waterford in Ireland, became Connolly's mentor and tutor, and in particular he was interested in the Irish question and in, in opposition to colonial rule, something that was unusual on the British left at the, uh, the, uh, the, the time. So this was quite a, an internationalist milieu here in Edinburgh in the late 19th, uh, uh, 19th, uh, 19th century. The SDF, the National SDF, concentrated essentially on making propaganda and on uh, standing quite unsuccessful, usually, in elections. Here in Edinburgh, they stood in elections. Conway himself stood in St. Giles' Ward, the Little, uh, little uh, Ireland, against the Irish National Party. 
that involved a real break with him from the community he came from politically because it was dominated by the Irish National Party, the Irish Home Rule Party, and of course by the Catholic Church. And he was attacked uh, by uh, uh, both in uh, uh, Townsend. They held propaganda meetings outdoors and indoors, but they also were uh, involved in many other things. It supported strikes. I mean, Connolly came actually into the, uh, into the left while he was briefly in Dundee as a result of a, a, a strike among jute workers in, that, uh, in that, uh, that city. And then in a free speech campaign, which his brother was involved in in, D in Dundee. Here in Edinburgh, the SSF in 1893 joined with the Trades Council, the newly formed independent, uh, independent Labour Party, to organise a May Day march down to uh, Queen's Park where Connor's brother uh, spoke. And to quote the, uh, a, man, a man called David Howell, who was a biographer of both of McLean and Connolly, Connolly, he said, was already emphasising the centrality of a Marxist understanding. But equally, he was committed to the search for a broadly based mobilisation for immediate objectives. Now, that's Connolly in Edinburgh. If you fast forward to uh, the beginning of the 20th century, the British Socialist Party, the new name for the SDF, that John McLean joined in Glasgow, was quite a different picture. This is a much more insular organisation than Conway's, uh, Conway's SSF in Edinburgh, dominated by skilled workers who were virtually entire, in fact, were entirely Protestant, Presbyterian, which made little or no effort to reach out to unskilled workers and or to Catholic workers who would be larger unskilled. And certainly didn't address the Irish question, which from 1912 onwards, the outbreak of the First World War, was the burning question of the day in terms of British, uh, 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 British uh, 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 politics. Um, it was also, I have to say, that uh, I think McLean discovered that the left in Glasgow was suspicious of intellectuals, and Conway, although coming from, you know, had been, having gone to university and become a teacher, would be regarded in that light, and was very workerist in its attitude. Very narrow in its uh, attitude as well, I was uh, 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 arguing. Um, so, if you read, and if you read, for instance, John McLean's famed economic lectures and notes for them, they are extremely orthodox. And there's no hint in the match of some of the debates which were raging at the time in the international socialist movement about imperialism, but also actually about Marxist economics on a wider, wider, uh, wider scale. Rosa Luxemburg, and I can never pronounce it, uh, Bohm, uh, Bauer, Bauer, the arguments uh, over these. There's no hint of that. It's a very, you know, orthodox uh, thing, which it almost reminds me actually of the Church of Scotland in the sense, here's a book, you need to read it. Uh, and that is uh, almost the kind of the, the message you uh, get, uh, get, uh, get across. In 1910, Henry Hyman, this leader of the British SDP, came out in support of a bigger Royal Navy. This was a time in the build-up to the First World War there was an arms race between Germany and Britain, and Britain was building dreadnoughts, these modern uh, battleships. And this met with strong opposition which inside the, the organisation, which included McLean. But another uh, author's of biography, Ripley McHugh, points out that he did not play a prominent role in the struggle against the social patriots. Uh, McLean, too, opposed Hyman's attitude to strikes, he supported workers taking uh, action during the 1910-1914 Great Unrest. But, firstly, I think McLean, up until 1914, was essentially a figure, of, if he was a figure at all, in Glasgow, not really beyond. And secondly, the other thing which I find uh, surprising, and this is a, a big difference in economy, there's no, and again, if I could be correct in this, I'd be interested, I find no reference anywhere about McLean to the suffragette movement, which is, again, the other big event which is taking place in Britain in the years up to the First World War. And the contrast uh, with Connolly, I'll come back to that in a second, is quite, uh, quite, uh, quite big. By 1914, in the outbreak of the First World War, Connolly had the experience both of Scotland, Dublin for the first time, and of the United States. In Dublin, he was involved in a, a milieu of feminists, cultural and physical force nationalists, and of course trade unionists and the left. And I think if you read it, it's an unusual, no, no, I would not recommend a book by a man called Ray Foster, Roy Foster, but a book he has written to coincide with the sense of this rising called Vivid Faces, goes through that generation of the people who made the 1916 rising. And they are actually very, and despite his eventual revisionist conclusions that this was a suicide of blood sacrifice, he can't quite hide the fact of his admiration for these people, and the fact they're actually a very attractive bunch of people. Some physically, but more, uh, I mean intellectually and, uh, and uh, uh, politically. 
And Connolly, James Connolly's writings on the centrality of women's liberation are one of, the, I think, his outstanding features. And I think, as well, they mark him out within the international socialist movement. The only two people I know, uh, again, the correct in this, is uh, August Bebel in the German, uh, sort of German movement, and Lenin. We've been inside Alexander Clark, I'm talking about male socialists, addressing this in any way. Connolly was really outstanding in terms of this, and of course, very much involved with organising women workers, but also in support, working with suffragettes like Constance Markovic, uh, Eva, Eva Godbrook, Mo, uh, Maud Gordon McBride, and, and, uh, uh, and others. In the United States, he'd been an organiser for the industrial workers of the world, working with Big Bill Hayward, Elizabeth Gurley Flynn, and others. While there, he taught himself Italian to organise Italian workers, but also German, which would take some doing for a man who received little or no formal education in a slum area of, Gla of, uh, of, uh, of, of uh, Edinburgh as a tribute to him. And I would say he had by now broken from the orthodox Marxism of the Second International, the main the grouping of the, the left, international left at the time. He broke towards syndicalism, a belief in essentially industrial action as a way to treat uh, uh, so, uh, socialism, particularly through an insurrectionary, a revolutionary general strike. But again, I would argue that was for, in terms of the choices on offer, that was probably the best available alternative in the period before October, the October Revolution in, uh, in uh, 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 terms of, before people knew about Lenin and what, uh, Lenin's theory of organization. The crucial issue both McLean and Conway addressed in 1914 was the outbreak of the war. And suffice to say for Conway, the, the reasoning that led him into the Easter Rising was dom were domestic and international particularly to strike a blow against war and that way to inspire a revival of the international working, uh, international working class organisation, particularly Germany, France, where the leaders of those organisations had backed their respective states in the war and there was, you know, uh, the, the left was demoralised and uh, confused about what was happening. The changes in McLean were far greater. Sure, there were signs there in his positive attitudes to pre-war strikes, in the coal fields, and particularly the strike at the Singer sewing machine factory in Clyde Bank, his opposition to Heinemann's militarism, and in the influence of the Russian revolutionary Peter Petrov. But really, it was only after 1914 and the outbreak of war when McLean becomes a key figure in the British left because of his outspoken opposition to the war and the prison sentences that that brought him. Uh, he also threw himself into the agitation around the 1915 rent strike, as a conclusion of which he lost his uh, teaching post, and in trying to push the Clyde Workers Committee, the grouping of shop stewards in Glasgow at the time, mainly based in the shipyards and engineering, towards an anti, uh, a clear anti-war position. That would lead to his exclusion from the Clyde Workers Committee at the hands of Willie Gallagher. Imperialism now becomes a central feature of an, the need for opposition to, to imperialism for McLean's politics. And after 1916, along with Sylvia Pankhurst, he was one of the few people in the British left who took a clear line in defending the Easter, uh, uh, Easter uh, Rising. And actually, like Pankhurst, went to Dublin shortly afterwards at the invitation of, uh, of Conway's, uh, uh, Conway's widow. I think it says something as well about the, uh, McLean that he never left Britain except to visit Belfast in 1907 at the time of the strike, and Dublin both in 1916 and two years earlier for a co-op annual conference held in the city. And I think he, in many ways he was a product of what was a relatively, has become a relatively insular British left, which was, again, careful, but relatively cut off with a lot of the debates which were taking, uh, taking place in the international socialist uh, movement. And his refusal to visit the Soviet Union unless the British government issued him with a passport, I find strange because of the sheer number of people from Britain and elsewhere in Europe who are, getting, who are reaching law school, despite main, uh, many legal uh, Ostlands. And for me, that means that while he McLean was staunch in support of the Russian Revolution, one, he was never obviously able to take his place in the leadership of the new communist international. He never met Lenin. And as a consequence of that, he never really grasped Lenin's concept of organization. Um, and if you look at his post-war membership of having left the British Socialist Party, of the Socialist Labour Party, and then his own organization, the Social Scottish Workers Republican Party, that did not entail a break with the old pre-war forms of organization. The emphasis remained on propaganda and standing in elections, along with work organizing the unemployed. There was no real attempt to organise in any serious way that I can make out in the workplaces. 
it should be said that the Communist Party, which had been set up as well, which McLean opposed mainly because he's dislike of Gatlow and Gallagher and the other leaderships of that party, also had to be kicked towards doing that uh, quite uh, quite big time through a rather strange organisational report which was issued on which I've got time to go into. Um, but really said uh, for McLean, he continued uh, while he defended the uh, the Russian Revolution. He never really, I think, understood and took up the lessons of what was coming out, and of course, you know, because he was never part of those, uh, uh, those debates. For me, the importance of McLean is his internationalist opposition to the war, his support for the Russian Revolution, and his opposition to British imperialism above all in Ireland, in part fueled by his belief there was going to be a war between Britain and America, not actually a lunatic prospect, in fact, it was genuine. I mean, America had emerged as the new kid on the block in terms of imperialist powers in 1918, and there were significant sections of both the Americans and British ruling classes who were considering and certainly planning for the possibility of that. It was the British ruling class who decided that they couldn't confront the Americans, it was too much for them, and eventually agreed to a series of deals which included, for instance, agreeing that the, the American Navy could equal the Royal Navy, which is a massive reversal of Britain's whole 19th century policy. The Royal Navy had to be greater than any other navy, actually any, any combination of navies in the other world. The importance of Conway lies, I would say, in this, and I'll bring it to an end. One, historical materialism is absolutely central to Conway, Conway's work. In particular, if you read Labour in Irish history, it is rooted in it, and I think in, in, in the method of it. McLean never wrote anything the equivalent of that. And when he was espousing a, the, a separate independent Scottish Workers' Republic, he never attempted to do what McLean did and go back uh, into uh, Scottish history and provide a, a, a grounding for, uh, for that. I think it would be difficult, almost impossible, to do that. McLean, uh, sorry, Conway, for instance, could go back into the Enlightenment period and take the United Irishmen, Wolf Jones uh, of 1798, and bring them in to the forefront as a living example of a revolutionary tradition which, within its limits, was very attractive and very relevant to the Irish situation. Conway's stress, I would say, on the emancipatory ideals of socialism was also much greater than of, uh, than of McLean. And in particular, as I said earlier, on the centrality of women's liberation. His vision of socialism, which appears in Conway's writings, it's quite interesting because he talks about it not being reduced to state ownership. And in one stage points out that the post office, the police station and various other things are actually state owned. But no one would go around arguing that these were social, as, as, as socialism. His real understanding of the need to build alliances, what we would know, uh, what we call later in Lenin's time, the United Front. And um, I think... Uh, the alliance he made in 1916 with the uh, progressive rep radical Republicans was, was strategically correct. It was a justifiable alliance. I should say in passing as well that part of the tragedy of it was that those Republican leaders executed were a much more attractive and interesting and actually radical group of people than the P Republican leaders who succeed them, Eamon de Valera and Michael, uh, Michael Collins. Uh, I am going to digress now. I, mean, I think it's fairly outstanding that in the uh, proclamation of the Irish Republic, there is a clear commitment. It's, first, it starts out addressed to Irish men and Irish women, which has to be said. There is a complete commitment that women have a vote. When a government in Britain is opposed to it, Lloyd George, Asquith, opposed to the suffragettes and put them in jail, uh, people dying in hunger strike, etc. Et this was just one. And of course, his biggest contribution, I'd argue, in Conway's argument, is the connection between the fight for national liberation and socialism, which is, is there, and is more than implicit inside of that, which I think, again, is groundbreaking. I mean, this was before people would have had a chance to read Trotsky's writings on, uh, on a permanent revolution, or Lenin's writings on the, the importance of revolution in East, or any of this. I mean, Conway had already grasped that, that in a colonial country, it was necessary to, uh, to uh, link the fight for national liberation to the fight for, uh, for, for socialism. I think in defence of McLean, I think, as I said before, his, uh, his stress on the, uh, the Irish fight for freedom post-1916 was relatively exceptional in terms of the British left, including in terms of the new Com uh, Communist Party. But again, he produces nothing in the, uh, in the way of providing a strategic way of what I was talking about. So if you'll excuse me, I'm aware of where I'm doing this meeting in Edinburgh, and this would probably cause some row with uh, Glasgow comrades, I would argue that, you know, 
it's not to diminish John McLean in any way, and particularly his role in opposing the war, the, the troubles he had in going to prison, and I don't think we can underestimate the a personal sacrifice he made. It's interesting, the film documentary maker John Grigson, who was at Glasgow University at the time, was involved in the campaign to free McLean and organised a meeting for him and said, this is a broken man who clearly suffered a nervous breakdown in Peterhead, uh, Peter, Peterhead prison. That's not to say something that he was mad, but he clearly suffered badly in prison and had a very debilitating effect on, uh, on him for uh, the rest of it. But I would argue that Connolly stands on a higher plane than McLean. And I think I can I think it's important that from our end of it, that of course it's, it's part of the centenary year, you've read enough of James Connolly, but I think it's important not just to uh, remember Connolly as being a Irish Republican hero, which he wasn't exactly in that sense, he was a sort of, but also uh, to go beyond that and rescue Connolly's theoretical contribution to socialism, because it is immense. And I'll repeat, this was a guy who had never really completed formal schooling. He'd left school as a, a young teenager, had joined the British Army and then deserting. You know, he brought himself up in Edinburgh Central Library, you know, reading books. That's how he won. He was an autodidactic, I mean, a formidable working class intellectual, actually. And again, I would be struggling. There must be some equivalence of that in the European socialist movement. But I mean, at that stage, I mean, he must stand out as being, you know, a self-taught Marxist working class intellectual. I mean, it's an incredible, uh, incredible ach achievement. And I think it's important in the commemorations which take place uh, this weekend and so on and so forth that we try and inject the idea that this was an important figure in the international Marxist movement who made a really important contribution to it and should be remembered as such. Yeah.